All right, AP World History. Moving on to Unit 6. And there you've got your title. Uh, we dealt with some of the consequences of industrialization, even in Unit 5, when we were looking at kind of like the rise of factory life and how that impacted, uh, you know, society, uh, you know, workers and that kind of thing. So Unit 6 is going to continue on that theme of what the Industrial Revolution does in terms of creating change, but it's going to look at it at a more more global scale. And a lot of the focus is going to uh, initially uh, really kind of center in on the, uh, the concept of imperialism, which we touched on a little bit in Unit 5 when we were talking about, uh, you know, the beginnings of, of some countries going out there and uh, establishing, um, you know, empires and, and that sort of a thing. Uh, so this is just going to take it to a uh, kind of a, a different level. All right. All right. So I'm going to get going up here and we'll uh, we'll talk about uh, when, I, when we talked about that term rationales for imperialism. In other words, you know, what were Europeans uh, at the time of our, you know, of our time frame that we're dealing with here? And, and again, we're still in that 1750 to 1900 uh, time period. But what were they using as their you know, rationale excuse, basically, what was the, you know, as, as they go out and start taking over uh, smaller, you know, less powerful countries and exploiting them, taking advantage of them, what is it that they're telling themselves? What are they telling their people? What are they telling the world as far as why are we doing this? Okay, it's like you see England over there on the right side and its little tentacles beginning to, you know, reach out from all corners of the world to where finally the, the British will be able to you know, in their minds, proudly say, you know, that the sun never sets on the British Empire because they had so many colonies, colonies spread throughout uh, the world. All right. So, uh, first of all, I'll start you off there with just kind of a, a basic definition that we'll be using here uh, for what imperialism is. And um, it's pretty, that's, I mean, pretty straightforward. You know, and this is just where, um, you know, various states of, of Europe, governments, uh, are going to make this, you know, a key part of how they operate. Um, and in many cases, you know, the direct connection to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the factories require raw materials in most of the European countries that uh, are, you know, deeply involved in the Industrial Revolution. Their supply of those raw materials is very finite, and so they're going to need to look elsewhere for those raw materials. And yes, you could purchase them on, you know, open markets worldwide, but why purchase when you can use your military power uh, and, and technologies to take over other countries? And once you have control over them, countries that have raw materials, then just simply extract them out yourself and, uh, you know, skip the whole middleman and the, the paying for them. All right. So uh, we'll jump into, into here. First of all, there's definitely, you know, we learned about this, this, this rise in, in nationalism in, uh, in unit five and how that helped to spur the, uh, the, the growth of, you know, literally new nations like Italy and Germany, um, in, in Europe. And so there's definitely going to be some nationalist motives when it comes to, uh, imperialism and, and this expansion that goes on. Um, let me pop in here. There you go. Uh, for a lot of these countries, that are going to be involved in this, they're, they're going to look at this concept of empire building. It's, it's kind of how they, they display, how they assert uh, national power and, and national identity. This is how they're kind of projecting this to, uh, to the world. Okay. Um, and, and just kind of give you a, a real quick little example here. Uh, you know, it's going to be during this time frame that uh, the Britain will claim control of Australia will assert, even more control over India and eventually uh, basically claim India as, you know, it's uh, really to a certain extent, it's main colony. And then also begin um, establishing colonies in Southeast Asia and really beyond, but that'll give you some examples. Uh, for the French, they will end up uh, joining the British. Uh, actually, I, I could have just as easily listed Africa up there with the British as well, but uh, uh, Africa will will definitely play role, especially uh, northern Africa with uh, with France and establishing colonies and empire building, but also um, the other places that I have listed there. Uh, Italy and Germany, um, they will eventually jump into uh, Africa as well, but uh, in the earlier parts of this imperialistic phase, 
um, you know, again, they're just getting off the ground as, as brand new countries. And so they're going to be playing a little bit more uh, catch up. And then uh, we talked about uh, Japan and uh, in our last unit and how, you know, they very rapidly began to industrialize after kind of being dragged into, uh, you know, into, into the, the modern world. Uh, in the 19th century, and so uh, during this time frame, they will seize control over the uh, the Korean Peninsula, and then uh, Formosa, take that island, uh, what is nowadays uh, uh, Taiwan, will uh, become part of of their little yet growing empire. All right, um, so those that covers some some nationalist motives, cultural and religious motives. Uh, this will get into uh, some areas that uh, that again, you know, why are Europeans establishing these these empires, uh, and and then we'll we'll cover these, and then we'll look at the economic part we already talked about. More and more so, you're going to see a lot of these European countries beginning to uh, to lean back on um, what we just refer to as as racial ideology. In other words, kind of you know thinking about the the attitudes that a lot of Europeans have. Uh, about themselves as as being white and then uh, non-white populations in other parts of the world and really there is this this hierarchy that is beginning to to develop uh, in the minds of many Europeans that that view the the globe the world as kind of you know think about some of the the kind of the, the pyramids that we've looked at you know that that structure societies uh, or caste systems and that kind of thing. And there are more and more Europeans who are signing on to the idea that, you know, at the top of the hierarchy of races uh, sits the white race and that the darker the skin color, the further on down that pyramid you go. And that, uh, you know, that there's this, this idea that, that white uh, cultures, white societies have a natural superiority and that uh, non-whites have a natural inferiority. And uh, this begins to really kind of set itself into place. I mean, it's nothing that's new uh, in the you know, 18th or 19th centuries. But uh, as we get into this period of empire building, it's definitely something that is going to um, develop even further. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, at the same time, I'll also point out that through this time period, there's always, pretty much in any of these European countries, uh, there's always going to be voices, uh, some of them based on religion, some of them just based on, I guess, ethics and values um, that are trying to point out, you know, the faults with, with this kind of a mentality, with this kind of a mindset, and, uh, and trying to point out where this kind of thinking can, can lead to really, really um, just ugly, ugly consequences, some of which we'll, we'll cover while we're, we're jumping into this. Um, social Darwinism also gets in this. Charles Darwin, who uh, who made himself famous by writing about natural selection, and you know, gets some of the uh, the credit for kind of uh, bringing um, you know evolution uh, and and some of those el 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 excuse me evolutionary uh, scientific concepts um, you know into the fore in the nineteenth century. Um, there were there were some Europeans that took his basic ideas and uh, and kind of twisted on them a bit to uh, to come up with this concept of social Darwinism, and really what it argued was that uh, that it was kind of you know it was it was kind of nature, uh, and and just how some kind of species of animals end up going extinct and others survive. Uh, social Darwinists say that you know humans are kind of the same way, human cultures, human societies humans in and of themselves and that and and then they make the jump to race saying that some races just naturally are put on this planet to rule over other races and uh and so you know they they look at the the power that uh is beginning to you know rise in Europe when it comes to technologies and military and things like that um eventually you know the United States kind of gets lumped in with this as well and that that's proof you know, the fact that the, that this is now the part of the world, you know, think about everything we've learned about this year and where, you know, we talk about, you know, there being uh, so much power at some point down in the Middle East, you know, Dar al-Islam at some point over in China. Well, now, you know, that, that main power is shifting to, to Europe and to some Europeans, that is proof of, 
the superiority of kind of Western civilization. And, and it is also during this kind of this time frame that, you know, you're going to see a lot of, you know, credit for things that, that ideas, thinking technologies that come from other parts of the world that some Europeans are going to try to you know, rewrite history a little bit to say that, no, 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 no. These, these ideas, these technologies actually originated in Europe. Um, these, these aren't, these aren't ideas that came from, you know, Eastern Asia or, you know, Southwestern Asia. Um, the, these started in Europe. And so some of it is a little bit of a twisting of reality to justify this mindset. Okay. Um, if we're looking at uh, cultural ideology, again, going back to some of these, these rationales um, and thinking about the way that Europeans were increasingly thinking about their culture compared to others. Um, we're going to see this play out as they begin to establish their colonies uh, around the world, you know, build these empires. And, uh, and we see it sometimes by just this real arbitrary approach to creating colonies, ignoring conditions on the ground in terms of the kinds of people, the kind of religions they practice, the kind of cultures that they have, language, things like that. And a lot of times Europeans just uh, kind of slamming people together who, who don't have the same cultures, languages, religions, but the Europeans just looking at them as a lens through, you know, that, well, they're, they're dark skinned. They're not like us and just expecting them to, to get along, uh, when they all get kind of mushed together into a colony. And then, you know, the Europeans kind of acting with shock and surprise when, when their subjects now, um, don't get along with each other when they're, when they're fighting because of, of ethnic, racial, whatever kind of, you know, language, religion kind of differences. Uh, but the Europeans kind of really take this really clumsy kind of approach to it because again, they're not looking at through, through this much more of a, a racial, uh, you know, kind of superiority kind of a lens. And so you're going to see some of that kind of thing go on. Um, you're also going to see the use of a lot of assimilation. And those of you that had me AP hug, we, we learned a bit about this and assimilation is the idea of, of taking a culture and absorbing it into a newer culture. And a lot of times it happens when just kind of naturally, when someone maybe moves from, uh, from one culture to another, and, you know, and, and thinking of that as a voluntary move is that over time, you know, you're going to learn the language, you're going to learn the customs and the traditions of that culture. Um, you know, in some cases, some people may even convert their religious faith to match with that of the new culture. Well, during this period of colonialism and empire building, a lot of this assimilation is going to occur, but it's not going to be by choice. Uh, Europeans, as they take over uh, and establish colonies, you know, whether it be in Asia, whether it be in Africa, wherever they go, uh, in many cases are not going to allow their new subjects, uh, you know, the populations of indigenous and native populations of these colonies they're not going to allow them a choice as far as whether they're going to learn to, to speak French or English or whatever it may be. It's going to be forced on them. Sometimes even the practice of religion, as much as is possible, is going to be forced on them. The French are a little bit more aggressive on this than, uh, than the English are. Um, you know, the, the English, uh, the Brits will, will by and large kind of, you know, if the colony is making money for us, we're all good. Uh, you know, as long as we're making money, um, the, the French are definitely going to be far more, uh, kind of steeped in the idea that, you know, you're going, we're, we're going to pretty much make our colonies kind of an extension of France. And we do want our subjects to learn French and, and to, you know, and, and even in some of the, you know, French culture kind of, uh, being forced on them. And, uh, there's definitely, there, there's parts of, uh, Southeast Asia you can still travel to today. And, you know, they have been free of French colonial rule now for what, 75, 80 years. And you still, um, you know, the, the French, the French names, uh, the, the, the shows of, of French culture that are, are still there. Um, and that assimilation, uh, even though these are all countries now, Vietnam, uh, you know, Laos, uh, and Cambodia even had some of that influence in there. You know, you still see some signs of it some of those places. Let's see. Um, and then, uh, religion, 
as far as where this uh, fits all in there. And kind of, you know, it's kind of a thin line between culture and religion because, I mean, usually it kind of gets lumped in there. Um, you know, we've talked about the role of missionaries before, uh, you know, whether we're talking about North America and the Jesuits and, you know, that sort of thing. But um, but we definitely see, we see pretty much all of the European countries that go in uh, and establish colonies. We see kind of always part of the process is this wave of missionaries who also move into the colonies to start working on converting, uh, you know, the people to uh, to whatever that European predominant faith is going to be, whether it's Protestantism, Catholicism, whatever it may be. Um, really, when we step back and look at it now, you know, not to knock the efforts of the missionaries, because, um, in fact, I'll get this right in here, uh, many of them are going to really, um, they believe in their mission. And, you know, some of it, it's, it's bringing education, it's bringing, um, you know, for 19th century, um, you know, in terms of health care and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. But we also look at those missionaries and we, we see kind of a, a, a dark side as well, whether it's intentional or not. We're pretty much we're, we're kind of seeing the Europeans on this process of preparing uh, the the native indigenous people of these colonies, preparing them for what's going to be economic exploitation. In other words, making these people work for little to no money in extracting natural resources that the Europeans then are going to ship back to Europe and, uh, you know, feed into their, their ever-growing factory systems. And, uh, and so, you know, I mean, you can look at that, at that religious aspect through, through multiple lenses uh, as far as there being a positive away from that, but also seeing that there's this this other side of it where it's part of the overall, um, you know, the process of of what imperial powers do uh, when they take over and and start that process. All right, okay, and then last but not least, talking about um, economic motives, um, which you know, maybe kind of saving, you know, this one, the, the last is maybe the most important because this is going to be about, you know, the industrial revolution. It's about these factories and the natural resources that they need. At the end of it all, it's about making money. You know, it's about making profits and that kind of a thing. And, and so that's something you really want to kind of, kind of lodged into your thinking there. Um, you know, when we talk about the, the, the cultural and the religious aspects of it, you know, those are really, in a way, just justifications um, for the economic aspect of this. Because think about it, you know, you're going out, you're establishing an empire, you're taking over these, these smaller, weaker countries. And, you know, if being asked by another country, by your own people, why are we doing this? You really don't want to say, you know, oh, because we can... We can take advantage of them and make a bunch of money. And so it sounds a lot better to say, oh, because we're bringing our superior culture to them to uplift them. We're sharing our religious beliefs with them to uplift them. You know, that we're, we're actually, we're, we're trying to, to nudge these people into a world and a life that is like ours. You know, we're, we're giving them this gift of Western culture, of Western religion. Which sounds a lot better than, like I said, just saying we're in it to make some money. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of think of those things as kind of these, these justifications. Um, like I said, the, there's no getting away with the connection with uh, the Industrial Revolution. You take a look at the map there of, of Africa and look at it in terms of natural resources. Um, you know, the, the growth of the factory systems in these European countries is just creating this just huge demand for for raw materials and and like i said before the european countries themselves are rapidly you know they deplete what they have and and so they're they're looking elsewhere also um th this is kind of this is kind of a double dipping if you think about it um because they're going to be able to pull and, and this is how these european countries oftentimes think about it it's kind of like wait a minute we can make money twice here because we're going to pull these natural resources out of these colonies and uh, and then, you know, the material, the, the, the products we make from those, we're going to obviously we're going to sell to our own people. We'll probably, you know, export them and sell them to other, you know, other countries. 
we're also going to send some of those products back to the colony itself and sell it back to its own people. Okay, the people that we have colonized are going to also become a customer of our goods. And so they're able to make money both ways off these colonies. Again, it's, you know, the, the Europeans view of this is, it doesn't get any more perfect than this, right? And, um, and then, you know, when, when we talk about imperialism in the big picture, you know, we've talked about these trading co- joint stock companies, trading companies. And really, when we look at the, the British East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, they represent what usually historians look at as the first wave of imperialism. Um, companies that were involved, you know, that were active in operating when the first uh, industrial revolution takes place. You know, when we see that, uh, that first move into, you know, Arkwright's uh, water frame and uh, Watt's steam engine, you know, that sort of a thing. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, the, uh, the role that they're going to have in helping to create colonies, um, the British, British East India Company plays a pivotal role in the establishment of India. Uh, as a colony, the, the British East India Company, huge down in Indonesia, you know, South Southeast Asia, uh, in that area, and establishing uh, colonies for uh, for the Dutch. All right, so uh, yes, the role that they play as well. All right, when we get to that second industrial revolution, where you see that shifting into uh, you know everything from you know, the rise of, of oil and then electricity and, and those sorts of things, you're also going to see what results in what's called new imperialism. And and this is going to be the imperialism that's going to lead through the mid to late part of the 19th century, really right up until about the start of World War I in 1914. And um, while there's going to be a, a bunch of countries that are going to jump in and get involved in this, um, as I've mentioned before, the British will be the ones who uh, will will kind of lead uh, the pack when when it comes to this new imperialism. All right, uh, number two, um, getting into this uh, state expansion area. Just a sec here. All right, I'm back. Sorry, I had a coughing fit. Just a little one. Coughing fit all the same. All right, so section two, state expansion. Uh, here's where we're going to get into uh, really kind of the uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, how imperialism operated, and um, and where we're going to first take a look at um, is going to be uh, Africa, all right? Uh, which, um, well, I mean, eventually they'll, they'll they'll even refer to it as the uh, the scramble for Africa, uh, which we'll we'll get to here in a bit. I'm getting ahead of myself. So remember, with with Africa, you know, we we already have. Um, of, you know, let's see like this European presence and kind of a European foothold that just goes back to, uh, you know, the Atlantic slave trade and going back to Portugal and then, you know, Spain and, and then and then the Brits and, you know, others who are jumping in and tapping into uh, to the slave trade. So um, Africa is involved in imperialism from its very earliest days when we're not even really using that term imperialism that much at, at that point. You know, we're going, we're going back to, uh, you know, uh, really 17th, uh, 18th century. Okay. Uh, so you have that. Um, well, there we go. That's, that's what he was talking about. Yeah. The slave trade. And then also, uh, you know, we talked about, uh, trading post empires and that sort of thing. And, uh, and so, and with those trading post empires, uh, some of that was to obtain, um, you know, trade goods that were in high demand, luxury items, things like that. Uh, but also there was this idea of raw materials as well. And uh, that's a concept that will continue into the 19th century and be a, a big, like I said, kind of spurring of uh, a lot of imperialism that uh, that goes on. Um, let's see, Egypt. Let's talk about Egypt, which, uh, you know, part of the Ottoman Empire, okay? And we were talking about the last unit that while it's part of the Ottoman Empire, it kind of did its own thing, though. Um, Muhammad Ali, it, its uh, leader during kind of its its heyday, was um, you know trying to kind of replicate a version of the Industrial Revolution down there in Egypt, um, being he was kind of far, far, far away from uh, you know from Istanbul and and was was able to uh, not always kind of follow along the same thing that the rest of the Ottomans did. Well, the uh, the government of of Egypt entered into a an agreement with a, a French company in the, uh, the 1850s, I believe it was, don't quote me on that, to build a canal that would uh, connect the Mediterranean out into the Indian Ocean. 
and so that you would not have to sail all the way around the bottom, you know, the southern tip of, uh, of Africa uh, to enter the Indian Ocean. Uh, this huge, huge shortcut. And, uh, and it, was, it was seen early on that it would not be, I mean, I'd say not difficult to do. Yeah, it's going to be an undertaking. Um, but it was doable that you could build this canal. And so uh, the French finance it. They entered into a contract with, uh, with you know the the Ottoman government in Egypt. Okay, and they agreed to do this, and they uh, built it. I think it's eighteen about eighteen sixty nine or so is when the uh, the Suez Canal opens up, and um, and it's it's a hit. I mean, it it does exactly what it what it promises to do. It creates this shortcut that just saves thousands and thousands of sailing miles in time. To uh, to be able to sail from you know from from Europe to uh, to Asia, um, the British um, to celebrate the the fact that the um, the, the the canal is so successful, um, they uh, they take Egypt from the Ottoman Empire in 1882. Um, it, it requires some warfare. It's it's not uh, it's it's not a war that directly is fought against the Ottoman Empire. It's uh, mainly against. Uh, uh, Egyptians who who don't want to be uh, suddenly you know British subjects, uh, but by 1882, um, Egypt and the Suez Canal is under British control. All right, so first little example of some uh, some imperialism going on there, and from there the British are going to uh, really begin this process of well even before then of of aggressively beginning to establish colonies. Uh, in West Africa, I'll give you some examples here. This one going all, I mean, literally all the way back to, uh, you know, the, the 18th century. And so uh, Sierra Leone, uh, you've got, uh, I'm just going to give you this little list right here. Some examples of uh, of all of these, okay? And, you know, some of these are going to be colonies that are established just through uh, through treaties uh, with with Africans. Some of them are going to uh, going to be, uh, require warfare. Uh, where the British will send in military forces to, uh, to you know, to quell the indigenous people who are, you know, trying to fight to uh, to maintain their, you know, their their own their own land, their own countries. Uh, but one by one, the the British start building this this little empire uh, in in Africa. Uh, France jumps in, and uh, and and some of it up in northern Africa, some of it down further into uh, to central Africa. Uh, but they begin to uh, establish their own colonies. Um, I think with Algeria was was nominally under Ottoman control, and so the French push them out and uh, and make Algeria a colony. And then, like I said, just to add on some of these these other areas as well. And uh, yeah, and that kind of brings us to uh, what comes to be known as the uh, the the scramble for Africa. And uh, I'll get a little bit of this and probably, because we're coming up on 30 minutes, probably cut it. Um, so um, this is going to end up getting, this is where the, the British, or excuse me, the, uh, the Germans and the Italians will finally get their chance uh, to, uh, to kind of jump into the imperialism game. Um, actually, you know, some, sometimes Europeans referred to this era of imperialism as the great game. Uh, because there was this competitive edge to it as far as, you know, who's going to get the most colonies. You know, we've talked about that game of risk before. Uh, it's almost like it's playing out in real life back in these days. And so this is where, yes, Italy and Germany will get their involvement. Uh, the Berlin Conference, which actually was a series of conferences, that uh, is, uh, takes place in, well, Berlin, uh, in the, you know, still fairly shiny brand new country of Germany. And uh, is hosted by um, you know by Otto von Bismarck, our uh, our Mr. Real Politic guy there uh, that you see in the center shaking hands. And this is a a meeting, a series of meetings that uh, the the leaders of all the major European countries are invited to, and the vast majority of them attend. And uh, and and pretty much what they do uh, at this meeting is they try to come to an agreement that all the European countries can adhere to as to how Africa is going to be divided amongst them. Um, the decision is already foregone as far as Africa is no longer going to belong to Africans. It's going to belong to Europeans. It's just a matter of who's going to get what pieces. And just like the, uh, the little cartoon over there on the right shows, I mean, it's almost like thinking of Africa as a 
as a cake, you know, and everyone's going to get their slice. Um, it's just a matter of who's going to get bigger slices, smaller slices, uh, that sort of thing. And so we, we literally do see, um, you know, kind of the, the rolling out of, of maps uh, at these meetings and this process of drawing lines on the map to say, all right, you know, this will become a colony of, of Britain. This will become a colony of Italy. This will become a colony of Germany and so on and so forth as they uh, divide this up. Um, as they go through this process, oh, excuse me, I'm going to keep it right there. Um, you know, this is, these are lines being drawn by, by men who've never been to Africa. They know nothing of the people. They know nothing of the culture. They know nothing of any of this. And so as they're drawing the lines, there is zero consideration given to, you know, the various African cultures and the different, you know, the, just the, the huge diversity within the population of Africa, of, of different tribes, different kingdoms, uh, different, you know, religions and cultures. You know, the fact that some of them are already practicing Islam, but others still maintain, uh, you know, traditional religions. None of that is taken in consideration. Lines are drawn, uh, like I mentioned earlier in the notes, sometimes lumping together Africans who have nothing in common with each other, but now uh, will be expected to to work shoulder to shoulder for the Europeans, and uh, and and just creating a just a, just it's just going to create a cascading effect of issues and problems that will continue even after imperialism ends and independence is granted back to these African countries. Uh, some of the issues we see in Africa today, 21st century, we can trace it back to, <coughs> excuse me, the arbitrary drawing of these lines and establishing these colonies uh, that, the, that the Europeans do here in 1884 and 1885. Okay. But reality is, is by the time we get to uh the eve of, of World War I, the map you see over there on the left side of Africa, all of it has been colonized by Europeans with the exception of two countries, Ethiopia and Liberia. Uh, Liberia has some connections to the United States uh, as being a, originally established as a uh, basically a haven for uh, slaves from uh, North America who might want to go back to Africa. And so because that has that U.S. connection, that one is left alone. And Ethiopia, um, a lot of it comes down to the fact that uh, they are, they are uh, one African country that's able to actually maintain uh, enough of a, a military and is strong enough on its own uh, to where Europeans decide to just kind of side skirt them. Um, they do have some natural resources the Europeans probably would have would have wanted, but uh, not enough for them to to make a big deal about it. And so Ethiopia will be will be left alone. But every other square inch of Africa is going to be under European control. All right. OK, that'll get us to start going on this one, folks, when we uh, when we jump in next, um, which will be soon. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at some examples of uh, imperialism in action in Africa. Look at uh, uh, the examples of uh, the colonies in South Africa and also the Congo. And then we will spread that out and take a look at uh, imperialism and the way it plays out in, in Asia. Okay. And kind of move it from there. Um, this is a, uh, a unit that we're going to try to move through as quickly as possible uh, to keep, uh, keep things, um, keep things going here. So, all right, that'll do us for now. We'll uh, we will be back to it soon. Bye.